sing the first and third verse of the song, and then Joe will lead us in prayer and we'll be dismissed to classes. <clears throat> Appropriate song as we prepare to study God's word uh, that he's given to us. Again, we'll sing the first and third verse. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming, to share the to do in this world. We're so thankful, Father, for this opportunity, and we pray that we'll take it wholeheartedly with an open mind and with an open heart, and that we would continue to seek your word diligently throughout our entire life. Thank you so much for the teachers that have, have been prepared to teach tonight, and we pray that the lessons may go as they had planned. We pray, Father, for those who do not know you, that we can teach them, and that they will find the answers in your book, in your word. Go with us tonight, Father, and those who are not with us, we pray that they may get better. And we pray that we can all all work together in this congregation. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. Good evening, how are you? Good to be here. I want to uh, commend, uh, I want to commend uh, the teachers of the congregation, especially those that are not been able to themselves be in a Bible class. We certainly hope that if that's the case with teachers, they would be able to have a break and come back to be themselves in Bible class. It's very important. 
And the second thing I want to say is, I know Patrick probably talk a little bit about this later, but at the university last night, there was a very interesting event that happened, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll just talk about this briefly, hopefully less than 30 seconds in Bob's time. So um, there is this uh, debate about Christian origins. And a professor at the university debated uh, Ed Buckner, who is a former president of the American Atheist Incorporated on Christian origins. And we had an elder of the church at Bremen there. We had a preacher here, there. And uh, we had some members of uh, various congregations there and a lot of students. Matter of fact, so many students, they had to move it to another location. And then they uh, had it so full, they had to basically turn them away. You know, it's supposed to stand or sit in the aisle. So that was a very interesting thing. So that's about 250, 300 people in that particular situation. I'm very proud of those people that were there. And uh, the professor, Dan Williams, uh, Patrick may mention this later, he's a member of the Church of Christ. And so he did a good job in presenting his information. And uh, I want to commend Brother Tommy, who got up there and asked a question at the end. It takes a lot of courage to ask a question in a situation like that. And so I commend Brother Tommy. Um, I did ask a question, and I did it for two reasons. I had a lot of my students there. And um, my question got to the root of um, the uh, atheist worldview. And my question had to do with the consistency of the atheist worldview, which if you studied my question now, that no offense to the man, but it totally undermined the, the uh, atheistic worldview. And so he couldn't have an answer to that question, but basically he said, I need a lot more time to answer your question. And then he went on and he talked. But uh, the point of my asking that question was you can, as a Christian, defend your faith. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's a president of American Atheist Incorporated, okay? Um, you can defend your, your faith, and the reason why is it's defendable. And we have been taught that there's academics and knowledge, and then there's Christianity and your faith. There's been a big disconnect in our country, and it has hurt and our entire country. And, and if it wasn't for Christianity, you couldn't prove anything. I mean, that's, that's the point. That may sound sort of absurd, but it only sounds absurd because of where we are as a country. My point is, is you can defend the faith. Now, you have to think. You have to be willing to spend some time thinking. And uh, that's something that we don't um, do a lot in our society, which perhaps we should do more. Um, the man said it was going to take him a whole lot of time, six hours to answer his question, and we should all read more. My point was... It only took me a minute or two to ask my question, and he should have took a minute or two and answered it. If, it. if he can't answer that, then there must be some inconsistency with his worldview. And that was the point. Uh, yes? Did you get to see uh, last night uh, President Obama's speech? Yes. him saying anything about that. But let me re let me go and download that. I'll, I'll come back next week and talk about that some more. I don't want to even speak off the cuff. But I did pay attention very closely. Yes. I, I would like to make a very, very brief statement about that. I do believe in global warming and not to be belittling. The earth is going to burn up one day and we need to all be aware of that and live accordingly. Okay? That's not to be humorous, okay, because that's to be evangelistic. The other problem with that is global warming is based in part on this graph that Dan Mann at the uh, Angola uh, Institute in the Netherlands put out, and it's been debunked, and I've been trying to call and contact that guy to have a good response to global warming. Does the temperature change? The temperature changes up and down, up and down. You may remember those that are older in the 60s, people were afraid of global cooling. Now they're afraid of global warming. It is my conviction that we have had a change, 
but environmentalists had latched onto that and have run a railroad train through that for the purpose of their political and policy making agenda. Now that is all I want to say about that. Now, um, let's do our memory work, okay? Who's got it? Brandon, you look like you got it. All right, so Ezra 7.10, what do you say? One word, people, one word. He, look, look what I'm pointing to. Ezra sought the law of the Lord and did it and taught in Israel statutes and judgments. Oh, that's pretty good. For Ezra, what? Set his heart to seek the law of Jehovah and to what? Do it. Do, you mean we can do God's word? Before I do it, i got to understand what I'm doing, right? Does can I do this? Can I do God's word in this world? Does it jive with everyday human experience? Yes, it does. And so once I do it, can I teach it? Shouldn't we have our teaching staff, all people who have accomplished doing God's word? Wouldn't that be good? Okay. All right. And and I hope that we do. All right. Very good, Fran. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Now I gave you a handout, and the reason why I gave this to you, I want to talk briefly, and I say briefly, about why I do some of the things I do when I'm up here. You may think I do them for attention or, or entertainment purposes, and you may be partially right, but it's all about learning. It's all about learning. How about educators? Okay, What you read, what you hear, what you see. What you see in here, what you say. And 90% of what we what? Say, yes, and do. Say and do. So you're receiving information, you're doing information. Okay? What did Ezra do? Read the information. He acquired the information. He did the information. But Ezra did one more step, and what did he do? Go you therefore in what? The gospel? Preach, teach, okay, teach the gospel. So, you know, this is really important. This is a great way for us to understand why we need to be involved in education and things that work in education. These people didn't discover, these people didn't invent this, they just discovered what works. And notice there's passive and active. May I ask you a question? Your child has sat in front of the TV. Is it passive or active? <laughs> passive, okay. Is our society passive or active? That's a good question. That is a very good question. And the point with the Christian life is the Christian life is a doing religion. It's a teaching and doing. And so that's very, very important. Okay. So I hope you get something from that. So how involved are you? And then look on the other side here. What do I have on the other side, good people? Three ages. All right, three ages, okay. What's the first one? Patriarchal. Patriarchal. So we're, we're familiar with that, okay. When did the patriarchal age start? Okay. When did the patriarchal age stop? Huh? Well, you all agree with that first one pretty good. <laughs> oh, it stopped at the law of Moses? Did it stop for all nations at the law of Moses? That's a very good point right there, okay. And so we have the Mosaic law, okay. Now, what do we have right after the Mosaic Law? We have a big what? A big cross. So the Bible says that what was nailed to the cross? Well, Jesus was nailed to the cross. That's what the Bible says, right? Okay, but we also know from other passages that the what was nailed to the cross? The law was nailed to the cross. And then we have the what age? Christian age, okay? Is that just a C? You don't see that C? Is it a C, or is there a reason why it's that way? That is exactly right. It hasn't come to an end. When will the Christian age come to the end? Okay. All right. Very good. Now, we're going to talk about these tonight, and I hope you enjoy that. I borrowed that or stole that from people, so there you go. Uh, we may be referring to that a little bit later. <coughs>
think that is all. That, oh, we need to have a um, quiz. Yes, okay, so I'll give everybody 30 seconds as, as fast as you can. Find one answer. seconds aren't up yet. Okay, now I'll do this a little differently. I do want to hear someone from this side give me a number and answer. Mystical, okay? All right, I'm not putting anybody on the spot here, okay? This is the whole section, okay? So, someone over here? Four, what do you say for hierarchical? Let me check with my what? Pass. All right, over here, somebody? Say it again. Two is allegorical. That's not allegorical, what is it? Two is allegorical, would be what? I changed that. E. E. Thank you very much. That's what you said? Oh, I'm sorry. You are so correct. I am so wrong. Okay. All right. You know, some people say that the Bible is just a bunch of stories. You know, they're just stories collected to, you know, teach moral lessons when man was in an unenlightened part of the world. All right. We had a hand here. Oh, you're going to answer another one? Go ahead. All right, inductive. That's right. You want to make a conclusion after you study what, folks? All of the passages. So that, you know, is a sort of summary of the different methods that we study. It's so important that we understand that because we all hear people say what the Bible says. We say what the Bible says, and we realize there's different ways that you get your idea of what the Bible says. The point is we want to get the idea that is being said by the Bible. And I have found out as I continue to talk to people that is not an interest to people. They do not really, are not very curious and very desiring to know what the Bible has to say. If, especially if it doesn't agree with their viewpoint of why things should be. And that is not good. Okay, let's look at this one passage as we get started. Uh, and behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And every living creature that is with you, the birds, um, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there be any more flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and between every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. What's the word covenant mean? Agreement. Agreement, okay. Agreement with who? That's basically two parties, okay. So agreement between two parties, okay. We call it the New Testament and the Old Testament. Sometimes the, you can read in people's Bible it says the Old Covenant, okay? All right, so let me ask you a question. There's only two covenants in the Bible? How many covenants are there in the Bible? Or we could say several, okay, all right? So um, now, in this case, this is what covenant? mankind in that by extension with Noah that he was representing all mankind but was this the covenant he made before the flood or after the flood 
Okay, how do we know that? I told you to. I'm going to do this again. Help me, okay? All right. So you're right. All right, so here's what I'd like you to do. You know, take a moment, please, and read through, you know, and briefly each one of those covenants. All right, and I'm going to be asking your section to, you know, talk about your co a particular covenant, okay? All right. Uh, let's uh, introduce some thoughts here. Why do we need to distinguish between the different covenants? See, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. So, number one, why do we need to discriminate between them? Oh, right, so we need, okay, we're not over them. So we need to know our duty. Uh, which law must I obey? Okay, now, I had the privilege of seeing firsthand the Magna Carta. That was amazing. Okay? And I have in my library the Articles of Confederation. I actually thought they were the Articles for the Confederacy. I was trying to read that, but that's not what that is. The Articles of Confederation are the, before the Constitution. Okay? And so, now we live under the Constitution. So it does matter what um, law we're under. So, uh, for example, um, the driver's manual is really a law, and we got to understand the law, you know, so we know what to do. By the way, can you drive with your parking lights on without your lights on? No. Can you coast down the road here with your car in neutral? No. If there's two crosswalks up at the intersection, do you have to stop at the first one you come to? Do you have to stay at the first one you come to? Everybody does, but do they have to stay at the first one they come to? Once they stop, can't they move up to the second one, provided there's no pedestrians? <coughs> I was... <laughs> What's the point? The point is, is that you need to operate under the law that you're operating, that you live under. Okay. Um, so now there are things that are in common with each of the covenants. Can someone please tell me what's in common with all these covenants? Is there what? Okay, they're made by God. Okay, what's another thing that's in common? Well, a lot of them are in the Old Testament. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. What's another one? What do they all require from man? Obedience. That would be a very powerful point right there. By the way, it's good to see Brother David walking in here in the back there. So, Brother, we're glad you're here. Okay. All right. Um, and each of these covenants is complete in themselves. Each of them has a circle, if you would. You know, where they begin, where they end. Things that are in that covenant, things that are outside that covenant. Okay. All right, should we circumcise our ch children today? For religious reasons? No, okay. All right, should we offer sacrifices when we come to God? Yes. Okay, all right, good. Okay, very good. All right, so there's a very important point. Now, uh, so what is the covenant? You defined it accurately. It's an agreement between two parties, basically God and man. Or God and a nation. God and a nation. What was the big nation God made the covenant with? <coughs> right. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is what? Okay, so we remember that. We remember the awe of Moses, you know, at Mount Sinai, and his disappointment at the same time. Um, we understand what God did for the Jewish people. But let me ask you a question before we go any further. Did God have in mind the law for all the nations when he made the law of Moses? Did God, um, yes. did God uh, looking down the stream of time, um, have a plan for all mankind, yes. even when he chose that one people, the Jewish people? Yes. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to look at that. All right. 
Now, let's take a look at these different covenants for a moment, okay? So rather than kind of ask you, I'm just going to, this side right here, I want you to pick one. I want you to do covenant one. All right, up to um, Lynn, this area here, I want you to do two. And then the back behind Lynn, do three. And this area here up to Tommy, you do four. And then the one behind that, you do five. You guys back there do five. And let's let this side here do six, okay? Now, what I would like you to do is answer the question, number one, what are the two parties, okay? What were the two parties for your covenant? Two, what were the conditions? What were the blessings? When did it start? When did it finish? Okay? All right? I'll give you a minute to think about that. You could you could uh, phone a friend if you want to, okay? No, nothing wrong with looking around. I know this is not normal for an adult auditorium class, but I'm sorry. And uh, started at the beginning, right when he said that. And when did it, when did it end? That's right. That's a very good question. Okay, it is a good question, isn't it? So when he disobeyed God, did death go into the world? Okay, death went into the world. Are we still bearing the consequences of that death? Yeah. We've been burying people, right? Okay. So yes, we have that covenant. The, the consequences of that covenant.
rainbow today? Can we say that rainbow today and talk to someone coming out of a store? See that rainbow? That's the sign of God's promise that he would never destroy the world. I did that one time. Okay? And then, wow, you know, that was interesting. Okay, so how about the back? How about uh, with Abraham concerning Christ? Could someone please tell me? All right, physical and spiritual. Go ahead. Change of priesthood. Okay. 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 All right. Now let's go through this a little bit, you know, in order. So if everybody would, let's read these passages. Okay. So if you would just. Um, uh, David, I'd like you to start with the first one, okay? Who wants to do the second one? Thank you, Robert. Who's going to do the third one? Steve, Steve kindly agreed to do the third one. Herman, you're going to do the fourth one? Okay, we'll just figure it out after that. All right, so let's talk about the first one. In Hebrews 7.14, the Bible says what? Hebrews 7.14. Well, but I want, want David, sir. Now, there's a priesthood in the Old Testament. What tribe? Levi, Levi okay. And um, now there's a change in the priesthood. So in the Old Testament, um, who, was the first, who was the first high priest? Okay, so, but he wasn't Aaron of the Levites? Okay. So there's a change. Okay, by the way, is it better? Is it better? Okay, now, I want to I just say something. This is my phone. When I call Patrick on, and probably bug him too often here, but this is the phone here. And my phone is a C phone. You know, it's not one of these smartphones, okay? You know, this phone can only do so much. 
I wish it, could, it would better. You know what I'm saying? Okay, it's sort of inferior in some ways. So, um, was the Old Testament inferior in some ways? Okay. So, uh, Brother Gray had a class on Hebrews, and I understand the people that went through that class had a tremendous uh, experience in going through that book in a very careful way. All right, so there was a change in the priesthood. Did the priest in the Old Testament die? All right, were the priests the physical ruler of the country? Okay, well, who, 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 who were the physical rulers during the time of the judges? That was a that was a loaded question right there. <laughs> well, who was the who was the ruler in the time of the kings? Now, who was the spiritual ruler during the time of the judges? Who was charged with the responsibility of teaching the people? The Levites were charged with the responsibility of teaching the people. Okay. All right. So. So, no, number one, there's a change in the priesthood. Okay, let's look at the second one. Let's read that second passage. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So, there's a change in the atonement. Okay? We call it the precious blood of... Why do we call it the precious blood of Christ? You know, Jesus is on the cross, right? His hands are nailed and his blood is dripping. And he's pointing backwards in time to that first sacrifice after Adam left the garden. And there were two types of blood that spoke. The blood of Abel and the blood of who? Okay, so in that blood, and then you go up to forward in time to all of that, all of that blood that was shed you know, I would like to see a YouTube video on an actual day in the life of the high priest and how much blood they shed. I think that would make a real impression on people. Okay, so so anyway, but Jesus is on the cross and then his blood also goes forward too and touches you and me and cleanses our conscience if we will understand the covenant that we live under. Now, during the Old Testament, the priest went in the, the holy place how often? Once a year. Once a year, okay. Yom Kippur, all right? And um, he offered for the people. By the way, did they get full forgiveness of their sins? No. All right. So let's go to the next passage, Deuteronomy 4, 7-8. Hebrew nation. Did that law apply to all the other nations? No. Why? Because God wanted that one nation. And what was the major purpose of the Hebrew nation, folks? To bring one man into the world. Who was that one man? Okay. Now let's look at this next passage. Hebrews 8 and verse 6. As it is, Christ Okay, so the new is more excellent than the old. Now, the old was conditioned upon the land, but the new is complete part, pardon, grace, the resurrection, and just like in the Old Testament, there was a land promised, the land of what? Help me out. Land to blah, blah, land. We, uh, the promised land, Canaan land, okay? And uh, But really, the Canaan land is a type of what? Heaven, okay? Now, if you're new to the study of the Bible, you may think we're you know just spiritualizing everything, but we're not. We've been through the Bible a few times, and we're just putting the pieces of the puzzle together. The Bible is a beautiful puzzle. Some people are puzzled by the Bible, and some people study the Bible, and the puzzle comes alive. 
So we have to be able to break it down into the pieces. All right, let's do the next one. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 11. Would everybody turn to that? And I want you to look at that passage and someone tell me what this is about. And I'll give you a hint. I want the word stone. So Haley, you knew that really well. By the way, can I get to heaven on Haley's Bible knowledge? Can I? I would say Haley's Bible. <laughs> can I get to heaven on Haley's Bible knowledge? No. So Haley knew it, but everybody needs to know it too. Okay. And I find that in a university, you're in a classroom and you ask questions, and Joe over here answers it. Everybody thinks they know it. Okay. But that's a reminder everybody doesn't know it, right? And everybody needs to study for themselves. Okay. Hebrews 8.11. Somebody want to read that? And they shall not teach every man his fellow citizen and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, and lead to the great Okay, so when you were a Jew, you were born into the Jewish nation, correct? And then you knew the Lord. But in the New Testament, it's different. What was Nicodemus told? You must be born again. Born again. Is there any other Christian than a born-again Christian? Then why do people say I'm a born-again Christian? That implies there's another type of Christian. Are you like, I don't know. Okay? I think they mean well by that statement, but um, we need to think about that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but you're taught and then you're born again. Okay. Let's look at another. What does the next passage say? Would you like to live under the Old Testament? Do you ever mess up and your conscience really bothers you and you wish you could just go back in time to where, you know, your conscience was really nice and it was free and you could think. What powerful blood was shed that we could have a clear conscience if we obey God through faith and obedience to the gospel. And not only that, we mess up, we could come back to God. Wow, that's really something. Let's look at one more. John 4. In John chapter 4, what what was said about the place of worship? Can you tell me? Neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem. The hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father, Spirit, and the truth. Okay. So there's a different place and form of worship. I've always wanted to go to Jerusalem. You know, I think that would be really neat, okay? But folks, we can go to Jerusalem today. We don't have to be like David and walk from the palace up there to the temple and go and see the sacrifices of God and get near to God. We don't have to do like Solomon, the wise man did. We can simply approach God through the study of his word as a Christian and come close to God. Draw nigh to me and I will what? Okay. Of course, and then in the last passage, the law was what? In Colossians 2.14, the law was what? Okay, someone read that passage. Okay, he nailed it to the cross. What did he really nail to the cross? The law of Moses. Now let me ask you a question. We talked about the differences, the fundamental differences between um, the, the uh, covenant at Mount Sinai and the covenant of Christ. And I started talking about my phone, right? Now, wouldn't it be great if I had a smartphone? I could do the internet, I could text, okay? You know, I think they're going to move it to your teeth, you know, text like this, okay? All right, but I, I don't know, okay? Wouldn't it be great? Um, and then, uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if it remind me about everything, had a nice voice? And uh, like had GPS, I could just hold it out and said, you're going the wrong way, okay? Um, and hey, you know like those little floor vacuum cleaners? Wouldn't it be neat if I could just put this on the floor and <laughs> vacuum the floor all at the same time? Well, you know, this is a great tool. It's a communication device. But God in the Old Testament communicated through all of these different covenants. And he communicated in the covenant of Christ in a way. God's trying to communicate to us. He's trying to send us a message. 
through time. And he's trying to send us a picture, if you would, through types and through symbols in the Old Testament about his great love and his manifold uh, desires for mankind. So the question is, is, I know in church we're supposed to keep our cell phone silenced, okay? But is our spiritual cell phone on? It's important that we understand that. So we really do have a smartphone connection with God because He is wiser than us. Okay. Um, make sure next week we memorize the uh, themes of the books of the Bible. And I want you to write down Ephesians 5.17. If you want to mark it, that's fine. All right, what I want to do is we have a few minutes here, so I'd like to open up for comments or questions about your reading, about the covenants, about that handout, about something that we talked about. Tonight. Go. Um, in the book you were talking about the fifty days where where the twenty third fifty days there's no covenant. Um, I just more information to talk about that that early on that subject. Okay, now I will try briefly for the purpose of opening up to Patrick and Brother Gray. The question is, when do we know the covenant of Christ began? Now, if we lived between uh, the death of Christ and the beginning of the church, we may be worried about that. But we live on this side of the beginning of the church, so it's really just, it's academic to us, okay? When the covenant of Christ began, we know on the day of Pentecost, everything started happening, okay? The church began there. The question is, uh, when did the covenant of Christ begin? Well, first of all, if I have a will, right? I have a will. When is that will in effect? Okay, all right. So it's in effect it, 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 when I die, right? Oh, it's got to be probated, okay? All right. Okay, now we want to know when the covenant of Christ began. When did the church begin? Okay, and, and the day, day of Pentecost. And, and what happened in the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit came with power, right? Well, the Lord went forth from Jerusalem as the prophet said foretold. As Jesus said in Matthew, in Luke 23, 47, or 40, 47, it would begin at Jerusalem, but it did not begin until on Mount Calvary. It began at Jerusalem. Okay. So the church began in Jerusalem. The law began at, at Jerusalem. So the covenant began at Jerusalem, at Jerusalem um, on the day of Pentecost. Now, your question is, what about those 40 days? Yeah. Well, I think some people during the time of the writing of that book made a big deal about, you know, when, when did the, you know, people, you, we can't know, okay? But we can know when the covenant began. All right, any other comments or questions on that issue? I may not answer it totally, but I could try. We could try. Any ideas you want to share? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sorry I didn't do a good job with that, but maybe that's just a difficult question. Okay, other comment or question? Harold? Ask that again. Okay, that's a good question. Okay, we got the law of Moses and the gospel, right? The law was given through Moses, but what? Grace and truth came through who? Okay, now, we understand the law. It's a whole body of things. All right, is Christianity a body of doctrine? Okay, so when, when someone says you obey the gospel, we use that word gospel in different senses, don't we? Okay, you're corrupting the gospel in Galatians chapter 1, that we're perverting the what? The teaching of the gospel, okay? 
So your question is, say it one more time. All right, I, I want you to know I'm, work, I'm working really hard, you know, trying to make this class work. And I do want you to know the first couple classes, I felt like I was on a date. You know, you ever been on a date? And the date didn't go too well? Okay, that, that is kind of how I felt a little bit the first, you know, couple times. But I'm trying, and part of it is it's just a tough kind of situation here. We're all tired on Wednesday night. But I think we're getting better. And, and look, I want you to know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but we need to be put on the spot from God because there's a test on this information, right? And if I die today, when is that test going to be given? So, so it's something I think we all need to be very diligent on and making sure that we're getting everything out of the class we possibly can. And I know I don't always come across the best way, but I'm doing the very best that I can and you're doing your um, reading and your assignments and all is very encouraging to me. And you asking questions is encouraging to me. Patrick, is there something you want to say before we finish? No, I'll say it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Please read chapter six. six okay, for next week. Okay. Chad, that is. Nine hundred forty eight, please, in your song books. Number nine hundred forty eight is good to see you tonight. We've had a lot of good rain. We're very blessed by the rain we've had and uh, thankful for perhaps clearing out. But uh, we want to thank the good Lord for the blessing we've received. I want to remind you about two competing fundraisers this coming Lord's Day. Uh, there's one uh, regarding the uh, McGuire family and their recent adoption. Uh, they've adopted three children, of course, and there's going to be a fellowship meal and, of course, um, some type, I guess you'd say money tree or what have you, gift cards in honor of that uh, adoption uh, or those adoptions. And also, there's going to be a fundraiser uh, for Camp Nagehi this coming Lord's Day. The Heart of the Matter campaign will uh, take place this Sunday. If you'd like to donate, you can see Joe about how to do that, and he'll be glad to uh, get you that information. Don't forget the area-wide singing will be next Friday, the 22nd, uh, at the Bremen Congregation at uh, 7 o'clock. It's good to see David here tonight. Uh, he's uh, really been through an ordeal, and uh, I got to see the, the egg craze the other day. I tell you what, it's a, it's a tough, tough bird to be here tonight uh, with us, and I appreciate you, and I'm glad to see your, your good uh, recovery so far. pray that it continues. I want to remind you about Tyler Kilgore, who's in Scottish Rite Hospital. Had been there for a couple of days already, and will be there probably another day or two at least, um, having some serious problems uh, with his digestive system. And uh, he didn't eat this afternoon, but then he got sick again, I understand, after I talked with him just for church. So uh, uh, they've done a biopsy on a, a spot they found in his colon, and uh, they're going to be looking at that. So we still 
kind of up in the air with Tyler, and so I want to ask you to please remember him in your prayers. Also, Diane Chambers, who uh, Stacy Pitt's mother, is recovering from back surgery, and still a very slow process, but remember her, please. Also, my mother-in-law, who continues to recover at home uh, from her open heart surgery. Ruth Ann Miller, Deanna's mother, going to be having a procedure next Wednesday to break up a large kidney stone and place a stent. Uh, so certainly I want to remember all these uh, in our prayers. Uh, Bob mentioned uh, last night uh, the debate that took place at the State University of West Georgia. And uh, I was privileged to be there, a number of us were, and I have to say it was really encouraging to me in a number of ways. First of all, the unbelievable interest that was shown. Uh, the, the auditorium was filled and overflowing and they had to turn people away, uh, which was itself encouraging. I understand that uh, Dan, who is a member of the church from Noonan, uh, one of the doctors in the history department there, is the one who arranged this debate, and the university, of course, agreed to allow it to uh, take place, uh, in my opinion, did an outstanding job in defending uh, the supernatural origin of the Christian faith, uh, faced off with an atheist, uh, a worldwide, a, world, a well-known atheist, uh, and yet both men, though from different perspectives, uh, conducted themselves as gentlemen, and uh, I believe it reminded us that we can have open, honest debate and discussions, uh, especially in school settings where they need to take place. You know, a lot of people have been wondering what Christian for Science is really all about, and at the heart of it is the idea and the push for opening the floor for competing ideas as it regards the origin of life on this planet as we know it. Uh, rather than just having one position uh, presented as the only, uh, at least allow open, honest discussion and debate. That's one aspect of our Christopher science. And so certainly we want to see that encouraged. I want to encourage you to encourage those you can at the State University of West Georgia uh, to continue this sort of open dialogue and exchange. Apparently it was well received and uh, people were excited about it. Uh, I'm excited to have the opportunity to meet this good brother. He's agreed through email already, Bob, to have lunch with me, so I'm looking forward to learning more about him uh, and his work. Uh, but certainly reminds us, when we see debates like this, what it must have been like in a time before my own when public debates took place all the time. And uh, there were those who were willing to go in settings like that, maybe at a church building or a courthouse or a school building or wherever, and uh, they would discuss not just uh, generally the origin of Christianity, but specifically uh, religious matters among believers. For example, the role of baptism or the role of women or you know, any number of issues that might be discussed and on people's minds. Uh, and I believe that was healthy and I believe it was good. It caused those who took the right position uh, to sharpen their skills and to understand better themselves what the truth is regarding these subjects, and it also helped to see uh, the other person's point of view, uh, and it helped those others. And I believe certainly that's the kind of thing we need to be doing, and God expects us to approach His Word and His will with an open mind. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Isaiah 1 and verse 18. It is good that we are able to reason. God gave us the ability to use uh, reasoning, and certainly we should do that. And as we Sing this song, number 948 tonight, as a song of invitation. Let me reason with you, uh, for those who've never obeyed the gospel, uh, to consider your soul's destiny and understand that outside of Christ, you are without God and without hope in the world. But in Christ, all blessings are yours in Christ to enjoy. And you can enjoy those blessings by gospel obedience, believing Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess faith in Him, and allow yourself to be buried and the watery grape of baptism to bury the old man of sin, to rise, to walk in newness of life. If we can assist you in this or any other way, please make that need known right now while together we stand as we sing. I am resolved to love. 